Hello. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to say. I never know. Uh, this, the images I'm going to show tonight were, were prepared by Stephen Croninger for a, a public conversation I did with Cal Schenkel a couple of days ago at the New York uh, Society of Illustrators. So there's probably a lot more commercial work in here than normal. Usually I'm trying to show my paintings because uh, I really started out to be a painter. I majored in painting at East Texas State University, graduated in 74, and uh, then had to become a commercial artist, and, uh, and I didn't mind that. Uh, but uh, labels do stick, and so I, as a, I, it was easy for me to become famous as an illustrator, and it was easy for me to become famous and known as a cartoonist, but a lot harder as a painter. And so I still, so I really, I'm not sure what's ahead in the slides. I wasn't paying attention at the public conversation, and it probably is a lot of uh, commercial art. This image in particular was a Frank Zappa album cover, and uh, and it's preceded by a. Uh, a ton of Cal Schenkel work, and Cal Schenkel was the guy that did all the early Frank Zappa albums, album covers, and he was an influence on my work, along with a lot of other people, because I really was a, an art nerd most of my life, and about age 10, I decided I want to be a modern artist of some sort, whatever that is, and so I'm fanatically interested in art in, in all manifestations, and in the 20th century, art, what could be considered art broadened and broadened until there was hardly a definition anymore. And so it seemed when I became a commercial artist that I would be able to run my uh, uh, fine art ideas through uh, media would seem like a thing to do. And I was able to do that to a certain extent. I did a very eccentric illustration, which meant I didn't do as much illustration because it was strange, but it meant I got a lot of fun jobs. and. Uh, so this was a Frank Zappa cover. I love Frank Zappa. If you haven't heard the first 12 albums of Frank Zappa, go get them. Go get the, uh, you know, go get the Captain Beefheart records, all the bizarre records output, and uh, you know, get with it already. Uh, and so anyway, I got a call. I was I went to L.A. with zero money. I got out of school in '74. I couldn't get any kind of artwork job in Texas. I got a job as, at a color separator working on dot etching when, back in the days when it was all dipping negatives in acid instead of computers. And then I got a job as a janitor for a year. And, uh, so, and I drove all over Texas trying to get work. Here, use my illustration for free. No one would have it. The galleries didn't know what to do with me because my work was like this. And, uh, and so I went to California and uh, was there for, uh, arrived just in time for punk rock, which was really good, because I was drawn this kind of way since about 71 or two, and I couldn't find a place for my work to fit, but it fit into punk rock graphics, because punk rock graphics were informed by fine art, like Rauschenberg, Klein, and so on. And so anyway, we'll see what's here. Oh, so anyway, I got a call to do a Frank Zappa cover, and I was like, great, Frank Zappa, oh my god, I've always wanted to meet Frank Zappa, this is going to be fantastic. And uh, so I did the cover for a, a, a great design agency, Rod Dyer Agency, for my friend Vartan, who's the art director. And uh, then I didn't meet Frank Zappa. And I turned it in, and I was like, that was kind of strange. And then I got a phone call from a different agency a few weeks later asking me if I wanted to do another Frank Zappa album cover. And I said, yeah, great. Well, we need it by tomorrow. So I did a one-night Frank Zappa cover. Maybe it's on here somewhere. And uh, this is the back cover of that album. They said, it's something about a mouse. But actually, it was about a uh, peccary. And uh, so I did the mouse. So anyway, then they said, do you want to do uh, another Frank Zappa album cover? And so I said, sure, I want to do another Frank Zappa album cover. And uh, so I started working on it. And then I called up the agency. And I said, I thought Frank Zappa was a control freak and that he would be involved in the album covers. And they told me, well, these are unauthorized albums. Warners wants to get rid of Frank, so we're dumping these on the market. <laughs> and so, so then I found myself on the wrong side of the fence, and it was humiliating and horrible. But I did three Frank Zappa covers. And, uh, and then Frank Zappa went on uh, Saturday Night Live and ripped one of the covers up and ate it and, uh, with, the, with the cone heads. 
And the Zappa family still uses the covers, and I learned later that Frank liked them fine, but I never got to meet Frank Zappa. Uh, but yet, not everyone gets to do Frank Zappa covers. I heard he didn't like the little skeleton in the middle of this back cover. That's the only objection he had. My friend Matt Groening that does The Simpsons, he became close friends with Frank at the end of his life, and he asked Frank about my album covers so I could have some, so I could sleep at night. This was the One Night album cover, Sleep Dirt. It uses the imagery, the image of which I've used in my comics of the smog monster from Godzilla versus the smog monster, also known as Hedora or Hedora in Japan. And this was supposed to be a really dark cover, but I only had one night, so I couldn't add the darkness. There's the back cover, which would have been very dark, <laughs> but it's not. So anyway, I was walking, I moved to LA, had zero money, my pickup truck blew up 75 miles outside of Fort Worth, and uh, I spent all the money I had to go to California rebuilding the engine, and then I got 75 miles outside of LA, and the piston went through the oil pan, and luckily there was a, a junkyard off the highway, and I just pulled off the highway, sold my truck to the, the garbage guy, or the whatever you call it, the dude at the, the junkyard and bought a ticket into LA. So I arrived in LA with zero money and not knowing anyone because my friend who had talked me into moving to LA had just moved to San Francisco that week. And so I ended up sleeping on a, a friend of, of his couch, uh, Justin Carroll, who was very nice and let me sponge off of him until I could drag my book around enough. And this is like an uh, important note. Even today, when everything is online, I think it's still really important to meet people face to face. And in those days, you had no other option, really. You could mail people postcards, but you really had to get your book in your hand and go to every record company, go to every magazine, go to ad agencies, and pray someone would hire you. And uh, let's, oh, anyway, punk rock. Oh, yes, and punk rock, rock happened. I was walking in, there was a newsstand in Gower Gulch, and I saw a newsstand a paper there called uh, Slash, and it looked like my work would fit into it, and so I asked a guy I knew, I said, who are these Slash people, are they Nazis, or are they okay? <laughs> and they said, oh, they're all artists, and uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I went and met these guys, they liked my work, they gave me a page in Slash, and then I started for free, and so I started working on this strip, and people notice stuff. When you get stuff in the media, then people start seeing it, as opposed, again, to galleries where you work for a year or a year and a half, have a gallery show, 100 people come in, the end. Maybe someone buys it. But if you do a Frank Zappa cover, or if you do punk rock graphics, then thousands of people see it, and, uh, and it goes ahead. Um, in those days, for a time, I was married to the manager of the Germs, and so Darby Crash was over at the house with Pat Smear and, and so on, and this was a flyer I did. I didn't do very many flyers in those days. Uh, people just didn't ask me. And I, probably I wanted money, too. It would have been good. So anyway, this looks like it's just going to be my commercial art, so let me, I'll have to end up complaining about commercial art, or maybe it's just all the fun stuff. Uh, and punk rock was fun, and it was a moment, but today when I go to Bushwick to shows, it's pretty much the same. It's people waiting around to see if something interesting is gonna happen. And, uh, and uh, often things, interesting things do happen. Uh, along the way, I met a guy, again, through my friend Matt, he was working in a record store, I think it was Licorice Pizza, maybe, with a guy named Phil Culp who turned out to be the president of the Residents Fan Club. And the Residents are those guys that are anonymous band who wear eyeballs on their heads and tuxedos, if you've seen those guys. And so I went up to San Francisco and did some artwork for them for their record company, and also uh, they ended up uh, recording a tune I wanted, I wanted to make uh, music. Um, desperately wanted to make music because I'd been playing guitar in my room for years because I grew up in the Church of Christ. And the Church of Christ was no musical instruments, no dancing, no imagery, football. <laughs> foot brutal football is cool, but dancing with your girlfriend, you're going to burn in hell forever. 
in darkness and gnashing, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And uh, so anyway, I'd been making music in my room and I got these guys to help me record a single and then my friend Phil put it out. And uh, today I'm in a band, which is a great joy of my life. In the last eight years, I've been in a band called Devin, Gary, and Ross now. It may be called Devin, Gary, Ross, and Kramer recently. Uh, we just, so we would, in Bushwick, we would practice uh, all night, every night. No, not every night, I'm sorry, I had to do other things. Uh, but on Saturday nights, we, that was our meeting night. And so from 7.30 in the evening till the sun came up, we tried to make music. And the other guys were really talented musicians, and I'm fair, and so this has been a joy. A couple of weeks ago, we went on a West Coast tour with uh, Sunfoot and No Age, and we did uh, nine cities in nine days from LA to uh, Seattle and back to Sacramento, and it was very intense uh, getting on the van. And uh, Kramer was the guy that was in Bongwater and I used to hang out with him a little bit 20 years ago when he was in New York. And he called me up out of the blue and got in touch. And we had just finished recording a two LP record. And so he ended up mastering it for us. And then we mentioned we were going on tour. So he wanted to go with us on tour for some reason, our, one of our heroes. And so it seems like he's in the band. And the day after tomorrow, we're going to Marfa to play an art opening. And so. I thought this was going to be the end of our band. I mean, this is really exciting, but this is what happens when you show random images and start free associating. Uh, I thought the band was over because the leader of the band just moved to LA and the best guitar player just moved to Woodstock and Kramer lives in Florida. So that's the end of the Saturday night uh, music sessions. But uh, people have, have flown us places in the last couple of weeks, so maybe we have a band still. We'll find out. But anyway, we're going to play Marfa, Texas uh, in a couple of days. It'll be, it'll be wonderful. So I worked on this ad campaign for Ralph Records, the, the residence uh, record company. And this is like uh, Sherman from Sherman and Peabody. I don't know if you ever remember that show. Oh, it was, on, was it on the Bullwinkle show or something? And uh, so this is part of the ad campaign. Uh, this was a single, another sampler of their music and the back cover of it. And this, if you don't, if you do silk screen, you know what a mechanical separation is. And this was a mechanical separation, which means all this art was done in black. I did four pieces of art, one to represent the color of each plate, and then it was sandwiched in the printing process, and then I got to find out what it looked like. And uh, from working at a color separator, I became pretty good at visualizing uh, how colors that I give to people all in black, turn, uh, what, what they're, how they're gonna mix in the, in the uh, printing process. And this was scratch board. Uh, not really a fun image. <laughs> kind of a, yeah. This is why I didn't do a lot of commercial art. Because <laughs> this was in my portfolio. Meanwhile, back in uh, 71, um, I was going to school at ET. East Texas State University, now called TAMU, not as good of a name. And uh, my friend Jay Cotton, who's a genius composer, lived in this little shack. And uh, we used to make music in there and play his piano with hammers and stuff. And uh, one night, we got a big carp about this big, and we put one of those 1970s striped tube socks on it and made little pipe cleaner glasses for it and put a pipe in its mouth and laid it out on the road in front of this little shack. And people would drive along and slam on their brakes in the middle of the night. And then we would show on the next house a 16 millimeter film, Fighting Films of France. <laughs> and uh, a little kid in the neighborhood, the second night we did it, made a little sign and he we, without us knowing, and he strung this little sign across the street behind the fish that said, hell. <laughs> so he knew at least one person in town was getting it. And uh, so that was uh, Dirchfall from the Cola House. And Jay and I met, uh, this Jay on the, on the right, <clears throat> we met in electronic music class uh, where we studied Buchla synthesizer, a giant synthesizer with plugins and stuff. And uh, our teacher, there were two teachers, 
and they both became mystics. And, uh, and so we meditated with Sufis, you know, for a while, chanted with Sufis and stuff, and that was really cool. I learned how to calm down a little bit, you know, meditation was to get that grasp on calming down a little bit was very helpful. And then people started astral projecting, and I thought, I don't really want to astral project, you know. <laughs> I'm just getting used to being in this body. And uh, so I dropped out of uh, chanting with Sufis, but that was pretty great. And one time, Jay and I went to uh, Dallas. We were in commerce, is like 80 miles outside of Dallas. And so one night, uh, a friend of mine who was kind of a joker gave me some uh, phony LSD made by the CIA. And I took it, half of it, and we went into Dallas to see Bill Evans play piano. And everyone turned into lizards and snakes and birds. And, and the club was like a big nest. And uh, don't take LSD, but if, if you do, it's really good when it rains because when the rain goes down the windshield, it goes down forever. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that was kind of a quasi bad trip. And then I ended up, I got depressed later in the year and I took the other half. And, uh, and then I went on a trip that I could take, you know, like eight hours, well, 12 hours precisely talking about uh, that I never came down from that trip and so that's called mental illness <laughs> and so I'm a little mentally ill I mean I feel fine I feel like a normal person but in on the trip I saw computer generated commercials from the future that later I would see on television <laughs> and it's specifically the Dow Chemical scrubbing bubbles commercial <laughs> which was, there's nothing more horrifying than wanting to see God and seeing a scrubbing bubble <laughs> chasing a rubber duck. And so anyway, that was bad. And so I got terrified. I moved back in with my parents for the, you know, you dropped out of school and just mowed the lawn and tried to be normal again. But then later I kind of got feeling okay again. And this was a, a, a single cover also for the same company, uh, for the residence company by a gentleman, Snake Finger, who played with the residents who died very young. He had a heart condition. And the work is kind of like a really uh, civilized version of a Harry Who, like a Carl Worsom uh, piece of art. And I hope you guys, your, uh, you guys know who the Harry Who were. The Harry Who were a lot of artists. The most famous were Jim Nutt and Carl Worsom. And they made work this maybe is a little active looking, but they made work that's positively psychotic. And it grabbed my attention. I thought, this is my kind of stuff. Psychosis. And, uh, and in the 60s, as geezers will tell you, um, it was an amazing special time in that Things, there was a revolution, which is why you're not wearing suits right now. It's because you would be wearing suit and ties and dresses right now if it weren't for hippie culture. And, uh, and so everything the hippies did in the 60s was co-opted immediately by J.C. Penney's and Sears. Like, op well, not even the hippies, like Bridget Riley's op art became dresses that my mother and sister wore. And, uh, you know, people started, they started selling beads and, you know, catering to the hippies. But when the Harry Who came along, it could not be co-opted because it was too psychotic and amazing. And it still has never been, I mean, this is the close. I tried to co-opt it and you get this. It still doesn't fit in J.C. Penney's. And, uh, and maybe it's good to get things in J.C. Penney's uh, to get them spread uh, throughout culture. Uh, but anyway, not the Harry Who. Check out Carl Worsom, Jim Nutt. This was another mechanical separation. Again, a piece that was like four black pieces of art that I executed separately. They were sandwiched in the printing process and the color mixing resulted. <coughs> um, this was, um, I saw a picture of Elvis standing next to Nudie, and Nudie was the guy who made the suits for the country and western people, and he made that gold suit Elvis wore. And Nudie was a little tailor guy, 
and Elvis was an alien from outer space. And you could see in the photo that Nudie was a human and Elvis was an alien from outer space. And so when Elvis died, I did this book. And it's really about uh, Elvis residing in the collective imagination because Elvis, people dreamed about Elvis. And, uh, and you can enter the collective dream time in a way. And uh, in, in the 50s, my family lived in Brownsville, Texas, the very tip of Texas. And it was a pretty dangerous place. And uh, all the little kids had knives this long. You know, I didn't. <laughs> Uh, but I had to fight and stuff. And luckily we moved away to a really boring town near Dallas. But before then I had these incredibly beautiful Mexican babysitters that I was in love with <laughs> when I was six, six and seven. And they would tell me about pachucos, about the gangs and their pompadours and their skinny belts and their peg trousers and their pointy shoes. And I was, I was totally amazed. And so this is kind of like Elvis as a pachuco in a way. <laughs> which also ties to, if you know Frank Zappa's work, there's a lot of Pachuco uh, flavor in early Mothers of Invention record. And again, if you don't go, go get those records, I'm sorry. Uh, do not get the Reuben and the Jets CD because Zappa fucked up the bass track. So get the vinyl. And I've never seen so many girls looking through vinyl as I have in the last two years in Brooklyn. This is like, it's great that vinyl's back. And <clears throat> when our record company makes, when our record, when our, when our band makes records, uh, they're tiny additions, as you know. People put out 100 records now, or 200 or 500. And this is the way that artists are finding a way to not have their music stolen by making a fetish object that people have to buy. And, uh, you know, and I'm from this generation of reading album covers for information, because in Sulphur Springs, Texas, where I grew up, the information came from uh, Skillern's drugstore, the newsstand at Skillern's or the little record bin, and every amazing thing almost in the 60s flowed through those newsstands into the popular culture, and uh, so we were always looking for clues. This was a John Giorno project. He was a beatnik, still is, I guess, a beatnik poet who got uh, the, uh, I don't know what they called it, they did away with it. When America loved art enough for a second to give money to artists, uh, John and a few artists did outrageous art, which got all of that taken away. But there should be outrageous art. And, uh, and now it's just you know a country that hates art totally, completely detests art and has nothing to do with art at all. Um, um, but football is still going strong. I went, my brother's, uh, he runs a big, incredible shop department in high school in Sulphur Springs, Texas now, and I went to visit and, uh, a few months ago, and he took me into the shop, and it was giant. It was as big as this, you know, it had every kind of machine you would want, and guys were building horse trailers, you know, and cages to capture their moms in and stuff. And, uh, and then he said, look at this, we got another building. And we went outside and there was a room like four times bigger than this room that was an indoor football field. And uh, so I said to my brother, wow, where's the poetry department? It must be incredible. <laughs> and uh, he just gave me a look. <laughs> like the look before you shoot your dog after you've dug the hole in the woods. <clears throat> and. Uh, so this is the back cover of that album cover. It has, you know, the Butthole Surfers. It's, it was a pretty good right, record. It has William Burroughs' advice to, uh, words of advice. And with, with William Burroughs' incredible, you know, deadpan delivery. And I don't know it verbatim, but it's kind of like, prefer no sympathy to the mentally ill for they are a bottomless pit. That sort of stuff. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, commercial art. Commercial art as opposed to fine art, our personal art, it's doing drawings other people want you to do. And usually, this was a fun job, Duke Ellington was fun to do, but often commercial art is anything you never wanted to draw in your life, uh, like overnight, and then do it over again the next night, <clears throat> and then get a kill fee because the job got canceled. And uh, so I did a lot of album covers, I did a couple of uh, Red Hot Chili Pepper covers, 
And those guys used to live in my neighborhood or, or their neighborhood in, uh, in LA. And I used to see them walking bare chested into traffic. They would just wade into traffic and stop the cars. Like no one does that in LA. You know, if you honk in LA, people get out with a baseball bat or worse and go nuts. But the Chili Peppers, they had a lot of sass. And so this was the album cover I did for them. Uh, and this was, you know, it imitates bad print jobs. And that was one of my things that I love was always bad print jobs. And, and when we lived in Brownsville, Texas, there were amazing Mexican wrestler posters. They were printed in five colors, all off register, all special mixed colors. And that really made a big impact on me. And so I imitate that sort of thing. Back cover. This was a plug single, the plugs, Tito La Riva, some friend, and it was a small scene. Punk rock was a small scene, so uh, you knew everyone pretty much. And I guess this was, I don't remember this, but I guess this was the inside sleeve or something of the same record. <clears throat> it's obviously taken from Posada, or Mendez, Steel and Calls. It's called steel engraving in all the books, but I don't think those guys were steel engravings. I think they were uh, maybe like etchers. And another Plugs album. This was also, there was a guy in LA. Hippies had it all over punks in terms of they, were, they had offset printing and silkscreen and they did incredible colorful posters and we just had photocopies for some reason. And so there was a guy in LA, still in LA, Richard Duardo, who was a silkscreen, who did the only silkscreen punk flyers uh, that were around for the most part. And this was uh, printed by him initially. <clears throat> in 1979, I, I've always read a lot of, you know, I've always read the art magazines since I was about 10. Uh, in 1967 or so, I saw an art forum at the, uh, we went to Tulsa and there was a big newsstand, and there was an art forum there with an Oldenburg clothespin on the cover, and I begged for it, and they didn't get it for me, cursed them. And, uh, but I got a hold of it, and I got to look at it, I thought, this is the greatest humor magazine in the world. And uh, it had Bruce Nauman, it had everything in it, and it, I loved it, I instantly was transfixed. And I was already reading everything I could about art, you know, because if you're a sponge, you're like you're looking through every book in the library. And by the way, I'll lose track if I segue, if I, if I sidetrack enough. But uh, a lot of stuff has not been scanned onto the internet. And so there's a lot of things lost to history. There's tons of people a little bit older than my age whose work is not on the internet yet. And so if you have a great, if you're around a great library, go through every fucking book in the library and look at all the pictures. You might discover, even read the words. <laughs> and uh, so I was reading a lot of manifestos. And if you read the, the Futurist Manifesto by Marinetti, it was crazy because it was like he was in love with uh, the speed, the early, not amphetamines, but just the speed of machinery at the turn of the last century. And so their art movement was like about a worship of speed and machinery and, and also the cleansing power of war and doing away with churches and doing away with governments and, and doing away with themselves, really, because they joined the army to, and got killed. And, uh, but these manifestos were very entertaining and interesting. And so I decided to write my own manifesto in 1979 called the Ross Tox Manifesto. And, and, and it was kind of like going along with the ideas I had as a, a, from art school, which I love pop art because my dad was, uh, ran a dime store. And so when pop art happened, I was like already used to the displays of light bulbs and stuff. And I thought it was great. And, uh, and looking at pop art, it was taking images out of media, which was very interesting and, and looking at them with an aesthetic eye and, and repurposing them. And I thought there might be, and, but pop was uh, written about as if it was very cold, cool. Pop was cool. And I thought maybe hot pop or warm pop would come next, where people would enter their work into media and then retrieve their imagery back out of media and do something with it. And I really got as far as putting my work into media. It didn't really turn out that I would like the result of 
painting pictures of any of this stuff. It was enough to do the commercial art. But the manifesto was about that, and it was really complaining about bad cartoons in the 70s, uh, before you guys were born, most of you. Uh, before Ren and Stimpy, and before Pee Wee, and before The Simpsons and all that stuff, there was like complete shit uh, cartoons foisted on generations of children that were, well, bad Popeye cartoons. If you've seen Translux car Popeye cartoons from the 70s, there's not a plot, so they didn't need writers. They have one song playing behind the action, whatever it is, one sound effect, and it was just brain death. And so I was complaining about that and saying artists should get into media and make it better, you know? You can only, if you want it better, you have to make it better yourself. There's not art talent scouts that are gonna come and knock on your door and go, please give me your incredible art. I'll give you all the money in the world for being an amazing artist. It doesn't happen very much. And you do have to, it happens sometimes. Uh, but you have to, you know, go meet people. And so this was kind of a joke manifesto, but it had some things I was upset about or angry about. And so that's what it was. And people, I was amazed that over the years, there's so many people have contacted me and said they had this on their refrigerator for years and they lived by it. And these guys called me up. There's a thing in here that says, join the art police. And these guys called me up and wanted to join the art police. <laughs> you know, like, who do we go get? I'm like, no, this is not it. But there was an art police already. There was an, uh, a group of uh, artists, I'm not sure, in Chicago or somewhere, who got angry that I mentioned art police and then were pacified when I said, don't hate me. <laughs> and the image is kind of, you know, that's the Picasso sculpture, probably a mix of Francois Gillot and her dog, her Alsatian dog. That's the sculpture in Chicago. I added a pompadour, make it a little bit more like James Brown. And I thought that would be a good symbol for the art movement. Um, so anyway, I was trying to be a painter all these years, but I saw Zap Comics. I saw Hippie Comics, and it made me want to draw comics. And so I started drawing comics. And uh, I call this a two-man gag strip. There's two guys in this strip that love to kill each other, and that's the premise. That's all that ever happens. They fight, they murder each other, and they're cartoons, so they're back to life. And they're the comics, cartoon characters that my cartoon characters read their comics in my comics. And, uh, but this, I thought, wow, I could be famous and rich just drawing these two guys. It would be enough. William and Percy. I could be the William and Percy guy. And it seemed bad. It seemed like a terrible idea. Like all the stuff I saw in Acid that was the wrong way to go. And William and Percy was the wrong way to make it the, the cornerstone of your life. This was a cover of Slash with my character Jimbo. And one day in about 1974, I drew Jimbo for the first time out of the blue and, and had this moment of like, oh no, I think I've invented something that's gonna stick with me. And I'm still drawing him, and I don't know why. Um, I keep getting ideas for Jimbo comics and I keep drawing them, and I do love many different media. And I'm gonna love comic medium. Uh, it's very different from painting. It works differently. It does a different thing. It tries to tell you a story or it tries to address the issues of telling a story. And Jimbo is this, you know, big lunkhead guy. He's actually got panties on here. <laughs> Normally he's wearing a little skirt and uh, he's usually wearing a little skirt. I don't know why. I think in Cub Scouts once, uh, they made us dress up in little, uh, what do you call them? Uh, what do you call those things that hang down in front? That's like a skirt. Uh, loincloth, a loincloth. <laughs> so we had loincloths on, and uh, they had a little fire built on the auditorium stage at Austin School. And it was a red light bulb with a fan blowing red cellophane up in the air. And we danced around it like Native Americans and uh, I draw a comic character with a little skirt now. <laughs> <clears throat> so this was another Jimbo comic. And uh, I let the style change in Jimbo, and that was what was probably seen innovative about it, because usually people, there's a lot of pressure on people to have a style, especially in art schools. It's like, get it together. What's your style? What are you saying? What are you trying to do? 
Well, really, a style catches you. It catches up to whatever you're trying to do. It comes out of your, in my opinion, it comes out of your coordination and your eye-to-hand coordination. And once you discover a style, or once it happens upon you, or once you're possessed like legion uh, by the style, then you have to wish the style into pigs and chase them over a cliff and, and go on with your life and, and explore further because a style, sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes you need ideas and ideas are cooler to chase actually. And I let, try to let my style in the early days uh, serve the, the, the idea rather than the, the other way around. So I did all these comic books. Raw Magazine happened. Um, Raw Magazine started in the early 80s by Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly in New York. And they saw my work in Slash and they invited me to be in that magazine, which propelled my career in comics more. And I got to meet this great community, well, all the community of cartoonists in the world. And the, and the Zap cartoonist and um, the cartoonists that came after. Like the cartoonists of these days are actually writing comics that New Yorker readers would read. Uh, but hippie cartoonists were trying to blow everything up and blow everything out of the water so we didn't have to wear ties. And, uh, and you meet these people. It's like meeting Jonathan Swift or someone. You meet satirists and they're lovely people and they're well-read people and they're gentlemen and women or whatever you want to say. And uh, that's one thing I discovered in this community of drawers and satirists, often the scariest people. S. Clay Wilson's comics are the most vile comics you'd ever want to see. And uh, he's a pretty nice guy. Now he you know, he's, has problems now because uh, he, uh, he was either beaten up or he fell down drunk and cracked his skull. So he has bad health problems now. But, if you have not seen, and I'm surprised that a lot of my students have never seen Zap Comics. Zap Comics was kind of a miracle melding of, uh, of advanced stylization of all these people that came together in the 60s in San Francisco, a lot of them from Texas accidentally. And I got to meet the younger people and they're my friends and they're neat. And it's neat to meet people. It's nice to be in your room. I love being in my room a lot, but it's nice to know human beings too. And uh, well, to see my paintings, you're just going to have to look at the show over here. Um, and uh, paintings is serious business. Uh, too serious, you know. It's kind of like, this stands for me. This is my soul here on the, on the wall. Oh no, I am paralyzed by my soul on the wall. What can I paint next? I don't know. I must stare at the wall for a month and figure it out. But once you get the ball rolling, that's a great thing. And it's a great thing about sketchbooks, by the way. I hope you keep sketchbooks, because sketchbooks are your friend. And even if you're not a drawer, uh, please start drawing in sketchbooks. Everyone draws a map, and everyone can draw a circle. No one can draw a straight line. So uh, ignore it when people say, I can't draw a straight line. You know, get a fucking ruler, you know. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with you, you know? And, uh, but, but just start drawing. And if you haven't drawn in your life and you're not a person, because it happens, everyone's a drawer when they're little, and then they lose, you know, oh no, Johnny's a better drawer. I better be a scientist. I better be a preacher. I better be a Scientologist. <laughs> And, uh, but if you start drawing again, you'll start kind of right back where you were, but that's a good place because you can't compete with children's drawings and you can't compete with mad men and women. They're just better drawers. And, uh, but if you keep sketchbooks, it's a repository of a lot of ideas and notions. And so when the day comes when you have free time, because this used to happen in high schools, you go to school every minute and then Saturday comes and here's your day and I would get deathly depressed because I didn't know what to do with myself. But now that I keep sketchbooks and I have hundreds of sketchbooks, if I have a free moment, I look through my books and I say, oh, there's that idea I wanted to do for 25 years, you know? <laughs> that one's no good anymore. Uh, I'll look through some more books and, you know, find, get the ball rolling. And now, and when I draw sketchbooks, I used to sit and wait for a brilliant idea, you know, for days. Oh no, here's a brilliant idea, now I can draw another page. But nowadays, I just draw Mickey Mouse. 
I draw Mickey Mouse, and then I draw Mickey Mouse with three ears and two noses and five eyes, and then the ball gets rolling, and then I start getting ideas. So the first Jimbo collection from Pantheon Books years ago, and odd things happen, like this was supposed to be just the promotional flyer, but it ended up being the cover of the book, which I wasn't really happy about, though I was very happy the book happened. But so there's always like the behind the scenes story you don't really need to know about. Because if you like this, great, fine, I don't need to spoil it for you. But yet you have your private wounds you nurse and uh, obsess about for no reason whatsoever. Uh, I did a series of comic books for Matt Groening's company, Zongo, years ago, and I had this brilliant idea from James Joyce, like reading Ulysses, there's, I'll get this all wrong, so, you know, so forgive me, uh, just that there's this notion in, I think it's Ulysses, where there's kind of like a germ, an embryonic growth, and uh, is that Ulysses? That's not Finnegan's Wake, that's Ulysses. And uh, so I had this idea that I would start drawing these comics really loose, just not try to be tight at all, just draw them quick and see how long it took. And then every issue I would get tighter and the comic would mature. And then people thought I wasn't trying to draw the comic good so no one bought it. And uh, it was very unpopular. But Matt did about seven issues, God bless him. And, uh, and now people seek them out on eBay. You know, Now you can't find these things because as they didn't sell, they printed fewer and fewer, so they're harder to find. And this was my comic of my collection of Glitter Rock comics uh, from 1971 and two. And when I was a Glitter Rocker, I was beautiful and young and had long hair and golden eye makeup and red pants and white clogs that fell off if you tried to walk anywhere in them. And uh, I made a lizard suit and uh, out of canvas, out of old paintings, and, and I took a work to a T-Rex concert in Arlington, Texas with my first comic strip. I printed up on a photocopy machine, and so at the climax of the concert, I danced down to the stage and threw the comics at Mark Bolin, and he was terrified. <laughs> and uh, his bongo player picked one up, and I thought, great, okay, good, and people thought I was part of the show, and, and that was, that was the glitter rocker moment. <laughs> Could come again. <laughs> I grew my hair out long when my daughter was born in 1990, when you guys were born. And because uh, my wife had short hair, and I knew instinctively that it's important for a baby to drool in someone's hair. <laughs> There's like vitamins babies get from hair. And so I grew my hair out really long again for the last time. and. Uh, but the night before my daughter's second birthday, I was mugged by three guys who drug me down by my hair and put a gun here and a gun here and a gun here and said, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. And I thought, these idiots are gonna shoot each other through me. <laughs> they don't know how to do it. What is wrong with these guys? And so I you know, turned my pockets inside out and you know, they ran off with my money. And, and uh, then I got a phone call the next day from this drunken woman you know, I was walking through Red Hook, I found your license in the street, you know, I'll sell it to you for $50. <laughs> and so I put $50 in an envelope and left it with a doorman. I don't know why, I just didn't want to go through the whole license thing again. So I took my last $50 and put it in the, the envelope. And so after work, after I got back from Williamsburg, I looked, went to the, the guy, you know, the guard, and he gave me the envelope and it was full of shredded paper. So I called the lady up and I said, look, I've got your phone number. I could call the police, give them your phone number. I'm sorry, I just was afraid you would stiff me and you would have your license and I would have nothing. So I'll come right back with your license. Great, see that you do. And I hung up the phone and it rang again and I picked it up and I heard, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And it was my friend Byron Werner who had just got a sampler and he was calling up everyone he knew and with great timing. <laughs> and so I like cut all my hair off like I did. Like right after the bad acid trip in 71 or two, I cut my hair off then again too uh, and became a punk rocker. So now I still draw comics and 
and it takes me years to do comics. So I do maybe 32 pages is a normal comic book length. I'm trying to do an 80 page comic and uh, I don't know how many years I've been working on it. But in the meantime, once I finished eight page chapter, I make mini comics like this and give them to my friends and then sell them for $15. And it's just like one sheet of paper cut in half and folded and stapled. So I'm really trying to discourage people from buying the things because then I have to staple them and stuff. <laughs> and this, but eventually, you know, they get rumored and they float around. Like any, any artifact you make, it goes out into the world and it comes back. It'd be amazing. The, the things you make, they fly away and they come back attached to people who say, this meant so much to me. Or, you know, or I made pants out of it. You know, or something, and that's kind of great. So I had the privilege this year. Uh, I have actually. Uh, I started reading. And I realized it was I, the book, the, the Pantheon collection we saw earlier. I don't know what I'm doing for time. I could talk for like five hours or something. So, just get do this. And, yeah. Okay. And uh, so anyway, I started. Uh, I named this book Jimbo in Paradise, and I realized I never read Dante. What am I doing? I've named a book Paradise without reading Dante. So I started reading Dante, and I ended up doing a version of Dante's Inferno with my stupid characters, and a version of Jimbo in in Purgatory. And uh, these are long stories to tell. I won't go into them, but Purgatory is not a friendly book. It's all like a reading list, really. And I could do about one panel a night for five years, and my readership is about 3,000 people. So economically, it does not make any sense for me to do comics based on selling comics. People call me, uh, email me all the time, wonderful kids. How do I have a career in comics? There is no such thing that I know about. And uh, there really is, but not in the kind of comics I do. But since I make nice drawings, I sell these drawings for a lot of money now and it saves my life, you know, so that's a good thing. So I encourage you, if you're doing comics, to think about it as a drawing and learn about fine art and galleries and try, you know, and you have to go talk to people. So anyway, I did the first two books and I didn't do Paradise and so I applied for a grant this last year at the New York Public Library and I got the grant to do the third book, which is Paradise, but I was sick of Dante at that point not his fault, um, but in the third book of Dante's Divine Comedy, he's just staring at Beatrice the whole time. And I thought, this is gonna be a boring book of Jimbo staring at Twiggy the whole time. And so I didn't do that book and I decided to, to research uh, John Milton's Paradise Regained. So I had this incredible opportunity of 10 months at the New York Public Library with an office, with private librarians, with a, uh, free snacks, and uh, specifically Famous Amos Cookies and Pirate Booty, which I never heard of Pirate Booty, you know, which is really just Cheetos with no orange dye on them. And, uh, and it was fantastic. So I went in and it was like, well, what do you want to see? Well, I want to see illuminated manuscript. And so these people, you know, the librarians came in with carts with like illuminated manuscript from all over the world, thousand year old stuff or however old it was. and. Uh, Really, people had a better attention span uh, before television and uh, when they were beaten daily. And because uh, this stuff was tight, it's microscopically tight. Just look, you, you, don't, you can't see it in a reproduction. But so anyway, I finished that up. I, work, I did 20 pages on my next book. And so I'm working towards more, more comics that are very indulgent. And uh, you know, there's some sort of intellectual or psychological exercise. And uh, so this is more pages from that book. And the premise of my book, do I have a little bit of time? Yeah, we can, uh, yeah, we'll do a Q&A like maybe five minutes. Okay, good. So uh, maybe I'll flip through these faster. I won't go into this. Just get this book, it's terrible. You can't read it. Uh, <laughs> it makes no sense. It's all like replacement text from other, other uh, English literature sources. And, uh, but anyway, they're dense. I was trying to make something like illuminated manuscript, but I don't have the focus that, that monks had, you know, uh, 500 years ago. But this is as close as I could get. This was my Inferno when Jimbo, the Minotaur, the infamous Minotaur he meets in, uh, in Inferno. This is the cover of Inferno. Dante's hell was cold at the center. It was not hot. It's frozen down there. So bring a coat. It's a cover for the Comics Journal. 
um, fabulous nerd publication that you might, if you're into comics, you might know about. This is a Jimbo doll made by a flower Frankenstein in San Francisco years ago. It had a little squeaker in the groin. <laughs> and uh, that's how we advertised it. Jimbo with squeaky penis. <laughs> and later, this was a doll made, again, Jimbo, with that shirt I designed in 1971. He's wearing it. I think this was from High Times magazine. So my friend Stephen Croninger really tried to find obscurities. And uh, in the old days, there was an underground. There still is an underground, but you have to look harder to find it. Because everything's the overground with uh, the internet. And so my father uh, stalks me online to find out my sins. <laughs> and. Uh, when he found this, he was not very happy. Uh, but he acts like he's not unhappy. And he's a cowboy and Indian painter, which is why I'm an artist. He's a real interesting person. He just turned 86. Luckily, he has not found P-Dog yet. And uh, hopefully, he will not find P-Dog. If you guys will do me the favor of not scanning it and putting it up on Facebook, I would appreciate it nor has he found the second P-Dog, the final captain's log uh, that followed. So anyway, I did get to make some music. This was a single I did uh, back in like 82 or something, Italian sunglass movie, very much influenced by the Harry Who type of execution of the image. And this is a back cover. And here's some buttons, punk rock buttons, again, more obscurities. And this was the record I'd made in 82 for a Japanese reggae music company my agent in Japan, Mr. Ishii, he brings reggae to Japan. And uh, so he had me do an album. And I traded studio, you know, trade, trading, trading, trading. I traded art for studio time at this giant The Bands studio in Zuma Beach. And so at 2 in the morning, we would go and record after everyone was done. <clears throat> and on this record, there's a tune where I'm, it's called I Fought the, I Fought the Lord and the Lord Won. And uh, in it, I'm pretending to speak in voices. So I'm chanting in voices at two in the morning out there like giving it everything. And I look up and Bonnie Raitt's standing there <laughs> looking at me and that was bad. <laughs> bad moment. More of that, more commercial art, more underground comics. And uh, actually here's an ad for Sahozet. We have Sahozet alumni here and uh, Ad from the old days in downtown New York. Mr. T, if you're a commercial artist, mostly what you do is paint pictures of celebrities, so get used to it. Uh, I can't draw John Travolta, <laughs> nor Sylvester Stallone. They don't have necks or features. They're, they're... This is a painting, and uh, I'm gonna run through these quickly, and I will be happy to take questions. But anyway, I'm a painter, everyone. I paint pictures. Look at me. Mark Newgarden did this uh, comic years ago. It's one of those, like, a desert island with two people sitting on the desert island with their arms around each other. And there's a guy swimming towards the island going, I like comics. So uh, that pretty much sums up a lot. These are big paintings. This is about six by eight feet. And when I was in high school, I painted giant paintings all the time. And when I was in college, I painted giant paintings. And then I paint smaller paintings now, but they're like, you know, four by seven feet or something like that. But I paint in a small room, and uh, so uh, you have to adapt. This was a poster for uh, a show of mine at the Aldrich Museum. This reflects my time spent on the border in Texas. <laughs> and, uh, but I don't know, you can like paint really, I think these paintings are interesting but it's really easy to never catch fire in the art world. So do not assume you're doing it for money. You're doing it for the pleasure of making this stuff. That is the reward. The word, reward is not celebrity, it's not money, it's not girl, well, if it could be girls, that would be great, but you have to choose the right girls. If you choose the wrong girls, you might as well just appreciate making the art and do that. It's another raw magazine. This was pretty, Kind of a famous strip I did that was really an apology to uh, Japan for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because we could have dropped the bomb in the ocean 
maybe, instead of on civilians. And uh, here's a mobile I made to promote my comics. I, and collaborating with artists is really funny. It doesn't always work, but if you find someone to work with, it helps you take your ego out of it. And as a commercial artist, you need no ego. You need to solve people's problems. And when you collaborate, you look for someone that you can both say, yeah. And I, I would work with Charles Burns, who's a great artist, and it's really fun working with him. And I work with my friend Edwin Pouncey, who's a very polite guy from England, who is like the English punk rock uh, cartoonist. And when I'm collaborating with Edwin, we'll be drawing, and he'll go, Gary, can we put a great penis on it? So you have to say, yes. Yes, Edwin, put a great penis on it. And uh, then you'll have a good collaboration. Luckily, I got through this without mentioning Pee Wee very much. You guys probably grew up watching Pee Wee. It was a fun show. It was made by artists. It was made by painting majors to a great extent. The design was, anyway. Rick Heitzman and Wayne White, and I designed this thing. This was the initial drawing I did of the outside of the playhouse that became a big model. And the model was, was actually overseen by my friend Rick Heitzman. And this design, I had in mind work he did in Texas after he took about 30 magic mushrooms and started making crazy paper stuff in his, in his room. And I knew that he would, so I did this sketch that, with Rick in mind that he would uh, be the overseer. I think the model turned out really cool. This is a really early uh, drawing for Pee Wee and Pee Wee products. <clears throat> My cat became obsessed with this rubber guy I made and would stand by it and meow all night. So I thought maybe all cats would like this. But it was kind of a, every cat was not as crazy about it as, as Ginger, uh, rest in peace. This is a book designed, um, a lot of my design in my books is designed by my wife, Helene Silverman. And it's really important if you're an artist, if you're a cartoonist, Design matters. If it's good design, bad design, it doesn't mind, but matter. But taking control of like how wide your margins are and stuff, it's very important. And uh, I think that's something that set me apart from other cartoonists because I was crazy about uh, book design and uh, so on. Okay, I guess well, this is sketchbook stuff. This was a book called Cold and Madness that has a long, boring story that goes something like the shortest version is. Mr. Ishii, my agent in Japan, he had published a collection of Jimbo comics. He called me up and said, Gary, we need more, one more book. We're doing one more book. And so I went to work trying to draw this thing for two months. I drew it like 200 pages or something. And then I, I called him up and I said, I can't do the book. I, can't, I need one more month. And he was like, what are you talking about? And it turned out he just was going to reprint the first book. And so I killed myself drawing this book. And it sat around for 18 years before my friends got rich for a second in the dot-com boom and published it. So you never know where a project's going to go or where it won't go. I do these little drawings for people that I sell on my website, the smartest idea I ever had. And uh, on 9-11, I was on building screaming and crying and drawing this picture and screaming, where's the fucking Air Force, by the way? And uh, it's just sketch, doodles, painting, Bigger painting, that's like three by eight or something. This is the first record Devin and I did together. Devin and Gary go outside. The last book I did, Dal Tokyo, about a Texas and Japanese settlement on Mars. A recent illustration for the New York Times book review. I don't get hired to do illustration very much, which is okay, because I make my living other ways, but it's fun to do something now and then. A Josh White light show is a whole nother story. Uh, I love light shows, and I'm blessed in that I met the guy, the most famous light show artist from the 60s, and now we collaborate on giant light shows. We're doing a show with MGMT in London, I think, in a month or so. And uh, that's a whole other story, very interesting, I think. These are phony flyers I did to advertise my little light show I did in my studio for uh, a year or so that was actually an attractor, and it attracted Joshua White to me. So it was a magic ritual. I'm going to reinvoke the 60s by making a tiny light show, making tiny flyers, and playing a lot of beatboxes at the same time as a light show. And you do something like that enough, it attracts people. It attracted Joshua White. Now we do gigantic light shows 
uh, in various cool places. This is the album cover for our band, Devin, Gary, and Ross. It's coming out in a couple of weeks. It's supposed to be out already, but hippies are putting it out. And, uh, and this is an uh, illustration of Frank Zappa, at least by fucking freak out and look at the gatefold. There's a list on the gatefold. The great thing about Frank Zappa was he gave you a reading list. He gave you clues about what was out there. And in the gatefold of freak out, there's an amazing list of artists and, and so on. So I think that's all I got here in terms of images. And I'd be very happy to answer questions.